Hello, and welcome to part 16 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. Tonight, we enter layer 6 of 11 in this massive iceberg. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to the members of the channel whose love and support make this much easier to do. And if you would like to support the channel, or if you just want to vote on which one of these projects you want to see next, you can click the join button below. With that being said, let's assume the rest in position. We are about to enter a world of mystery. San Francisco, John Doe, number 60. July 15th, 1985, San Francisco, California. The body of a young homeless man would be found wedged underneath a tractor trailer of a semi-truck. This man was about 5 foot 5 and around 130 pounds, and he had been wrapped in a blanket before being abandoned in the streets. And while this is awful in itself, what was really weird was the victim had been sadistically tortured and murdered. According to the press, he had been killed in a ritualistic fashion that made one think of a devil worshiping ceremony. And this wasn't just media hype to sell a story. Police noted his hands had been tied behind his back with guitar string, had several marks on his neck, candle wax poured into his right eye, had an upside down pentagram carved into his chest, been slashed multiple times with a knife, genitals mutilated, and lower lip cut open. This last gruesome part was expanded upon by the media, which they claimed the cut had been placed there to more easily consume the victim's blood, but police have never stated that, and it may have just been the newspapers reporting that due to the satanic panic of the 80s. The investigation on what happened to John Doe number 60 went cold for a good two years until a man named Maurice Bork would come onto the radar of detectives. This man was already in prison for kidnapping and robbery. Apparently, the victim of this crime would claim that during the time Bork had kidnapped him, he had scratched a pentagram onto their chest. Bork obviously was convicted and now set in prison for the past year, and it was here that he would contact detectives to let them know he had information about an unsolved crime. That was who was responsible for what had happened to John Doe number 60. He would claim that the man behind it was his ex-lover, a man named Clifford St. Joseph. Investigators looked into this man and would actually end up arresting him. The case would go to trial, and the witnesses to it had a mix of convicts and drug addicts, which included Maurice Bork, who was still in prison. Another one of these was a man named William McCrae, who would speak about Clifford St. Joseph's obsession with Satanism and the occult. However, it was pointed out by the defense that McCrae had never brought this up before until St. Joseph's court documents were brought to his cell that he shared with McCrae, and McCrae got to hold on to the documents, although he swore he didn't look through them. But right after this, he coincidentally made a statement to police about the satanic occult stuff and was released from jail, which certainly looked suspicious. However, even with that, and with no physical evidence tying St. Joseph to the murder, he was convicted anyways, and he was sentenced 34 years to life, but St. Joseph would always stick to his innocence, and since the early 2000s, he has asked for DNA testing to be done, which is now prevalent, as a means to exonerate him. And although lots of witnesses have died since the murder, it's been speculated that maybe Maurice Bork was the man behind the John Doe 60 murder, and he framed his ex-lover for it. Don't forget, Bork was the man that scratched a pentagram into the torso of a previous victim, and he was also a guitarist, where John Doe 60's hands had been tied by guitar string. So did authorities convict the wrong man? 1966, Triple Murder of Hendersonville. July 17, 1966, Henderson County, North Carolina. Two men were on a dirt road near Lake Summit at a place where people dumped their trash. They had been clearing some brush and brought over some limbs and brambles to get rid of. And it's here that one of them would notice what he thought was a mannequin. The two would move in closer to get a better look and notice it was not a mannequin. It was a person, actually three people, who had been bludgeoned to death. That of Vernon Shipman, Charles Glass, and Luis Davis Shoemate. All three had head wounds, but Charles and Luis also had puncture wounds to their chest and neck, 21 and 17 respectively. The bodies were placed in a semicircle. The men were clothed, but Luis had some clothing removed, and it was obvious that she had been sexually assaulted. Vernon was left with an 18-inch long piece of scrap iron laying on his neck. Charles's crutches were laid over his body in the shape of a cross, and a whiskey bottle 
was tilted off of Luis's neck. Nearby, also lay Luis's prescription sunglasses and purse, near the two men's wallets. The two men were well known in the community. Vernon owned a music shop in town that Charles managed. Luis, however, was an outlier. She was a 61-year-old factory worker from Asheville who kept to herself. No one is sure how she knew the men, if she even did. The triple murder obviously upset the town, which is fairly small, and it caused rumors to swirl, which is partially fueled by the fact that Vernon and Charles were gay. Before the discovery of the murder victims, who had been dead for about five days, a missing persons report had been filed for the men, but the police at the time assumed they were partying somewhere, you know, because they were gay, or that's what the police chief said at the time, although it's possible that he didn't mean anything by it, because Charles was known to throw huge parties that had a hundred or more people. As detectives started to investigate deeper into the murders, they found a huge pool of suspects. Apparently, Charles had relationships with quite a few wealthy prominent men all over Asheville and Hendersonville. Like a lot of cases from this time period, the crime scene wasn't handled properly, with many residents coming from the area to view it. In fact, days after the scene was processed, people reported finding human remains that were missed. Detectives did start retracing the steps of the trio and found that there had been several sightings of Vernon's vehicle the day of the murder. The last sighting came around 6 p.m. when a resident named Ronnie Hollyfield would see Vernon on a single lane dirt track. Charles was with him on the passenger side and a woman with an odd smile that he did not know was in the back, along with a man that wore sunglasses that he did not know. This man was obviously the lead suspect now. He was 40 to 50 years old, white, and light-colored thin hair. The car was later found by some teenagers who pushed it to the location it was found, parked in some grass weeds and briars about six miles from the crime scene. The keys were still in the ignition. In the years since, six suspects and motives have been narrowed down, ranging from murder for hire, jealousy, revenge, and one final one that just had a long criminal history. That one was the most likely suspect, and his name was Edward Thompson Jr. In the past, he had kidnapped nine people, sexually assaulted five, and killed two in a crime spree in 1968. He would actually be arrested for other crimes and would die in prison. He was said to have told others he was the one responsible for the murders. Although, I have to point out, he doesn't match the description of the person in the back seat. Regardless, due to the fact that he, as well as the other suspects, are all deceased, and the fact that all the evidence has been lost, this one will most likely never be solved. 1966 World Cup Finals Ghost Go This 50-year-old mystery revolves around the debate of the 1966 FIFA World Cup Final, which seen a very close call on a score awarded to England to put them ahead in extra time in their victory over West Germany. Instead of describing it, I'll just show it to you here and let you decide on your own. Basically, after Jeff Hurst kicked the ball, he did not have a great view to see if it actually crossed the line or not, but instead assumed it had based on the reaction of his teammate who started celebrating. Unsurprisingly, the West German goalkeeper, Hans Tilkowski, held the view up until his death that the ball never crossed the line, claiming that it did bounce on the line, but it never made it to the other side, which I guess is different than American football, which only has to break the plane. Anyway, this has been debated ever since. I know it's a big deal to soccer fans, but as far as the mystery, I'm not sure. AEW World Championship Theft In the year 2019, AEW World Champion Chris Jericho had just landed in Tallahassee instead of Tampa due to bad weather. And because of that long layover, he decided to hire a driver from a limo company that he trusted who would drive his party home. He put his bags in the back of the car and the belt was in a gray velvet bag separate from his luggage. He then asked the driver to take them to Outback Steakhouse. However, the driver suggested Longhorn Steakhouse, which was closer, and it's here when the story takes an odd turn. While at the airport, Jericho mistakenly grabbed the wrong suitcase. Because of this, the driver had to go back to the airport while Chris was eating and switch it with the person whose bag that Jericho had grabbed. When he returned, the driver would weirdly just wander around the restaurant while Jericho and his crew were eating before he slowly walked back out to the limo. 20 minutes later, the driver came back in and told Jericho that the title belt was missing, even though it had been placed in a nondescript bag that the driver never touched or was even told about. 
Jericho understandably upset, asked how this was even possible, and then went outside to investigate. When he got to the car, Jericho noticed that something he had bought for his wife had been moved from the trunk to the back seat and appeared to have fell on the ground at one point. He would ask the driver if he had locked the car during his walk around the restaurant, to which the driver said no, and Jericho flipped out. It's then that the Longhorn manager told them to call the police, informing them that there were several surveillance cameras in the area. Police arrived and took statements, and Jericho was forced to leave without his brand new company's title, which cost about $30,000. Jericho would then call his boss the next morning to explain what had happened, and the company was then deciding if and how to publicly announce it. But before they could, the local police department called a press conference and announced it themselves, and taking an even stranger turn, days later, Jericho would come across an article that showed the police officers parading around with the belt, taking pictures and posting them online, and this police department had still not called anyone to tell them that they had recovered it. So where did the police get it? According to the official report, it was found by a 41-year-old Florida State University employee who said it was in a velvet bag in the middle of a turn lane. He grabbed it and threw it into his vehicle without looking at it and took it home and posted it to the lost and found section of Craigslist until he seen the news and then took it to the police department. However, Jericho would dispute this and said the road this man found it on was nowhere near the Longhorn Steakhouse, nor was it near the road they had taken from the airport. Also, he pointed out that no one would have just picked a bag up off the road and thrown it into their car without looking in it, as this man had claimed. But strangest of all was apparently the driver just happened to be at the police department when the Good Samaritan brought the belt in. Security footage was reviewed and it found nothing and the case is still opened. Akita City Empty House Calls It is not unusual for emergency hotline operators to receive a call where no one is on the other end. Sometimes, it ends up being a prank, or an accidental call, or most frighteningly, someone in danger and cannot communicate. But sometimes, it ends up being something truly unexplainable. This next mystery falls in the latter category, and happens in Akita City, Japan, where occasionally, the fire department 119 emergency number will get a call come in where they hear no voice, but instead, various mechanical buzzing and rumbling sounds. The spookiest of these happened in 2014, when fire trucks were called to a villa deep in the mountains at about midnight. When they arrived, no one was inside, and all the doors and windows were locked. The phones were also properly hung up. An investigation eventually blamed the whole thing on a fault in the phone line. Phantom calls are part of the job, and happen about once or twice a year, which is due to technical glitches, and the operator will call back, and if no one answers, firefighters are sent out. That's part of the protocol. However, in 2020, it went from one to two calls a year to nine calls alone within the city. They come at various times of the day, always from landline, and usually the residents aren't even home. You can see all the problems this causes, which is why the fire department pushed the phone company to look into the matter, who did, and they could not find an explanation either. One fire chief speculated that the problem came down to the people who still had rotary phones, which in a country like Japan, where fax machines are still widely used, it's very possible a few people are clinging on to rotary phones, but it still doesn't explain why there has been an uptick in calls, and why it's happening in this one city, and why the police department, which is 110, has not gotten any of these calls. Alex Slowly August 2nd, 2008 16-year-old Alex Slowly of London, England would leave a friend's house around noon, intending to return back to his home for his birthday, but never arrived. The teen had very little money, and no change of clothes, nor was he carrying his passport. His disappearance has very little info available, and that might be because, well, it's just like he vanished into thin air. No scene of a crime, no clues that he was even thinking about running away, no footage of him moving about on security camera, and even stranger, his cell phone stopped working after he went missing. It would be over a year later, in September 2009, before the first sighting of Alex reached the media. That was in Ilford, East London, and even that sighting has not been confirmed. However, according to Alex's mother, who stated in July 2015, she was surprised to learn the police had received numerous reports of sightings in 2009, and law enforcement kept it secret from her. As mentioned, there is very little info in this case, 
and even less theories. Detectives have tried to connect it to 14-year-old Andrew Gosden, who disappeared in 2007, less than a year before Alex vanished, and within two miles of where Alex is thought to have vanished, leaving investigators to speculate that a serial killer operates in the area. Finally, there is a lot of speculation online that states that Alex was involved in the drug trade. However, police have never stated this. Andrew Gosden It's fitting that we move from Alex's case to Andrew's, since one of the detectives in this case believed the two are linked. On September 14, 2007, 14-year-old Andrew Gosden of London, England would struggle to wake up for school, putting him in a bad mood. His mom noted this was different, as usually he always woke up on time. At 8.05 a.m., he would leave the house and was seen walking across a local park to his usual bus stop. But instead of taking the school bus, he diverted from his usual route and went to a cash machine at a local garage where he withdrew 200 pounds from his bank account, almost all of his money. He was then seen on security footage returning back home. Once returning, he placed his school uniform in the washing machine and blazer on back of a chair and changed into casual clothing. He then grabbed his wallet, keys, and a PlayStation Portable console, though he did not take the charger. At 8.30, he was seen leaving his house and made it to Doncaster Railway Station, where he purchased a one-way ticket to London. The ticket seller would state later that she informed him a return ticket price cost, but Andrew insisted on a one-way ticket. By 9.35 a.m., he was seen boarding a train alone, and a woman would end up sitting next to him, who later reported him was being quiet and deep into his video game. It's at this time the school tried calling Andrew's parents to inform them that he had not showed up. However, they dialed the wrong number and left the message for the wrong person. At 11.20 a.m., Andrew arrived at King Cross Station and was captured on security footage, leaving the main entrance at 11.25. This was the last confirmed sighting. Meanwhile that evening, the Gosden family sat down for dinner, thinking that Andrew was in the cellar playing video games. When they did discover he was not home, they thought he went to his friends, so they called that residence, only to find out that Andrew was not there, nor did he go to school that day. They would then call the police at 7 p.m. Andrew's father would then go retrace the route that Andrew typically took to school, while police started their own search, finding nothing. Detectives and family started to look into the thought that Andrew had met someone online, but this was quickly ruled out. He did not even use a computer, nor did he have an email or an online account for his video game consoles. The question quickly turned to why Andrew decided to go into the city in the first place. His family thought he wanted to go see some of the sites, as he enjoyed doing that with them, especially the museums and exhibitions. It was also thought he may have wanted to see one of the concerts planned that night, which might explain why he changed into a Slipknot t-shirt and took a bag embellished with various patches of rock and metal bands. The venue was within walking distance of King's Cross. However, there's no evidence that he was interested in these bands that were at the show that night, although he did like similar bands. Over the next year, there were 122 possible sightings of Andrew from all over Britain. Of these, two or three came within the first week that he went missing, and those were deemed the most credible, specifically the one that placed him at Pizza Hut, about an hour's walk from King's Cross on the day that he went missing. There are a lot more details about these various sightings, but in the interest of saving time, I can't delve into them. But in December 2021, after receiving a tip, the police arrested two men in what is believed to be the first official connection with Andrew's disappearance. These two unnamed men are 38 and 45 and were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and trafficking, as well as possession of some lewd photos. Police then seized their devices for forensic investigation, which could take up to a year. The men, however, were released while investigation continues and nearly two years later, nothing else has been said, leaving many to wonder if this investigation goes much wider or if the detectives found no evidence linking the two to Andrew's disappearance. Aquatic Ape Hypothesis The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis is a controversial and alternative theory in the field of human evolution. It suggests, at some point in our evolutionary history, ancestral hominids the ancestor of modern humans, had a semi-aquatic or aquatic phase in their development. This hypothesis was first proposed by a British marine biologist, Alistair Hardy, in the 1960s and has been further developed and discussed by various proponents. 
These people argue that the human ancestors may have adopted to walking on two legs as a result of spending significant time wading in the water. They propose that walking upright in shallow waters could have provided an advantage for activities like foraging, hunting, and evading predators. It also suggests that humans have relatively less body hair compared to other primates because hairlessness is an advantage in a water-based environment. Hairlessness, according to this theory, would improve swimming efficiency and reduce the drag in water. There's also the thought that humans adapted to breath holding, which would obviously be helpful when we're diving and foraging for aquatic food sources. And finally, people that believe in this theory argue that a semi-aquatic lifestyle would have provided access to a diet rich in seafood, which could have played a role in the development of human intelligence and brain growth. And that diet still exists to this day. Of course, the mystery is, is this theory true? Atlanta Murders of 1979 to 1981 This is one you have no doubt heard of, or seen shows and documentaries about, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's probably better known as the Atlanta Child Murders. This mystery is about a series of murders committed in Atlanta, Georgia between July 1979 and May 1981. In that span, at least 28 children, teens, and adults were killed. Police would eventually apprehend a 23-year-old man named Wayne Williams. He would eventually be tried and convicted in at least two of the adult murders and was sentenced to life in prison. 22 of the other 28 victims had been linked to Williams, although he was never tried for them and he maintains his innocence. Of those, only four were adults and six are still officially unsolved. And I'm not sure, but I think that's where the actual mystery in this one lies. How many of these murders were actually committed by Williams, if any? Uh, some people are skeptical that he was a serial killer and cite that his conviction relied on a few strands of fiber that the prosecution claimed were found on the bodies of two of the victims. Those fibers matched a rug in Williams' car and blanket found in his home. But fiber evidence is less than reliable. This has caused other theories to pop up, the most popular being that the KKK was behind all the murders, particularly that of a man named Charles Sanders, who was heard by a police informant to verbally threaten to choke a black teen who accidentally scratched his truck. That teen would end up being one of the Atlanta child murder victims. There was more fuel added in 1986 when Spin Magazine uncovered a secret investigation by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which had found that Sanders, along with other KKK members, were planning to kill more than two dozen black children to incite a race war in Atlanta. And it was alleged this was suppressed by the authorities to keep peace in the city. In 2019, the Atlanta mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who grew up during the height of the child murders, reopened the case, asking for evidence to be retested using the latest forensic technology. However, there are two things going against Williams. For one, the former FBI agent, John Douglas, the pioneer of criminal profiling, and the Netflix show Mindhunter is based on, had actually predicted that the serial killer would start dumping victims into a body of water. So law enforcement discreetly put police officers in these areas to watch, and it wasn't long until an officer posted under a bridge would hear a splash hit the water from something that had been thrown from up above. He called it in and described the vehicle seen leaving the area, and police pulled over Williams just down the road, and days later, a body of one of the victims was found in the river. Secondly, the murder stopped after Williams was arrested. Well, at least officially. Defenders of Williams cite that their murders kept occurring and that there was a cover-up by authorities. Regardless, investigators from the local levels up to the FBI have all concluded at this point that Williams was not responsible for all the killings, leaving open the mystery of who was behind the others. Even the mine hunter Douglas himself doesn't think that Williams is responsible for all the deaths, connecting him to only 12 of them and citing that many more children continued to die after his arrest. Atlanta Ripper Staying in Atlanta, we look at another series of unsolved serial killings. This one is more obscure, and occurred between 1911 and 1914. The victims, anywhere from 15 to 21 of them, were all black women. Although, there is some debate that the first murder occurred in 1909, the first official one came on May 28, 1911, when the body of Belle Walker, a cook, was found by her sister just 25 yards from her home and her throat had been slashed. Then, 
about two weeks later, a woman named Addie Watts was hit in the head with a brick, dragged to some bushes, and had her throat slit. Then again, on July 1st, two weeks later, 20-year-old Emma Lou Sharp was waiting on her mother, Lena, to return home. She had left about an hour previously to go get groceries and had not returned. Normally, this wouldn't be a big deal, but with all the murders, Emma was nervous. She eventually set out to search for her mother. She arrived at the market to learn that Lena had never shown up. Lena would then head back home, hoping her mom had made it back. It was then that we get to the first description of the suspect. As a man described as tall, black, broad-shouldered, and wearing a broad-brimmed black hat, approached her. He would ask her how she was doing, and Emma Lou would reply cordially and try to walk on, but this man blocked her path, telling her, don't be afraid, I never hurt girls like you. He then immediately stabbed her in the back. Emma took off running and screaming for help. She would then faint due to blood loss and awoke to see the man standing over her with a knife in hand. Luckily, footsteps was heard in the distance and it scared the perp off. Not so luckily though, Emma's mother Lena was found dead and her head was almost completely severed. She too had been smashed with a brick. July 3rd, just a couple of days later, the eighth victim was found. Now the panic that the black population of Atlanta felt was very similar to the one that would be felt seven decades later during the Atlanta child murders. Women stopped going out to the streets at night. The situation was tense, to say the least. And five days later, on July 8th, 22-year-old Mary Yettle left the home of a man named W.M. Seltzer to go to her job as a cook when she heard a low whistle down an alley. Looking, she saw the killer coming towards her. She screamed and ran back to the home. Seltzer came out the door with a revolver in his hand to see this crazed individual chasing Mary. Seltzer ordered him to raise his hands, yet the man ran off down the alley. The police were called, but by the time they arrived, they found nothing. July 11th, the body of Sadie Holly was found in a small gully and she had almost been decapitated, and on the scene, a two-pound rock was found smeared with blood. After this, the governor offered a $250 reward, or about $8,000 in today's money. It did little to help because on August 31st, 20-year-old Ann Duncan was found dead by the railroad tracks. Again, her throat had been slashed, and it continued until November 10th when the body of Minnie Wise was found in an alleyway with her throat cut too. Two weeks later, the worst yet, November 23rd, an unnamed victim was found with her head almost cut off and her heart was cut out, lying beside her. More bodies would be found over the winter and then to the following year of 1914, but police started to suspect that a lot of these were just copycat killings or just unrelated to the serial killer. If he did exist though, it was probably the work of two separate men, that of a 27-year-old laborer named Henry Huff, who was apprehended in bloody clothes on the night of one murder, or 35-year-old Todd Henderson, who was seen with the victim right before she was murdered, as well as being identified by Emma Lou. However, police never had enough evidence for a conviction in either case. Burned House Horizon The Burned House Horizon refers to the geographical area where archaeology of Neolithic Europe shows a strange phenomenon, that which is presumably intentionally burned settlements. This tradition, which was primarily in southeastern Europe, is thought to have lasted from as early as 6500 BC to as late as 2000 BC, right at the beginning of the Bronze Age. Although it's presumed that these peoples, for some reason, had a tradition of burning down their homes and cities, there is some debate if it was intentional or not. However, most concede that it was very doubtful to be accidental, which leads to the mystery. Why were these peoples burning down their homes and settlements? And why was it being done so regularly? There are some settlements that were being completely burned every 75 to 80 years and being rebuilt right back on top of each other. Others were burned and then completely abandoned. There's not a lot on this one, but the theories are as follows. There is a small chance that the fires were accidental, but archaeologists have almost ruled this out. Another theory cited war or aggression from a neighboring people, but again, this one was also ruled out because there's never been any evidence found of human remains burned in the ruins, nor were there any weapons found lodged in the skeletons. A more believable theory suggests that it was a way to recycle old material 
to build anew with, and other sites that it could have been a way to get rid of pests, disease, or insects, or to free up space to add on to the settlement. And finally, another theory proposes it was just a symbolic means of moving on, like a ritual, to mark the end of life of the house. Although, I have to say, I am disappointed that dragons wasn't offered up as a possible theory. Carol A. Deering On July 19th, 1920, to Carol A. Deering, an American five-masted commercial schooner, would depart from Puerto Rico and arrive in Newport News, Virginia, to pick up a cargo of coal that was to be delivered to Rio de Janeiro. The ship was captained by a man named William H. Merritt. On August 26th, after clearing the Virginia Capes and heading for Rio, Captain Merritt fell seriously ill and the Daring headed toward Port Louis, Delaware to drop him and his son off. The Daring Company then recruited Captain Willis Wormwell as a replacement and they would set off on September 8th and safely deliver the cargo without incident. Wormwell would then give his crew leave before departing on December 2nd when they stopped for supplies in Barbados. It's here that this odd story starts to play out. The first mate, who had been recruited along with Wormwell, would get drunk in Barbados and was overheard complaining about how he was unable to discipline the crew without Captain Wormwell interfering. This first mate was abusive to the crew, according to the captain. The first mate also complained about how he had to do all the navigating due to the captain's poor eyesight. So while drunk, he stated he was going to kill the captain before they made it back to Norfolk. He ended up being arrested at the port for public drunkenness, but Captain Wormwell forgave him and bailed him out of jail and set sail. The ship would not be sighted again until January 28, 1921, when it was seen by a Cape Lookout lightship. The captain of that ship, Captain Jacobson, said a tall, thin man with reddish hair and a foreign accent who was obviously not Captain Wormwell, was speaking through a megaphone and would tell Captain Jacobson that the vessel had lost its anchors in a storm off of Cape Fear and ask if the ship's owners, G.G. Deering Company, could be notified. Captain Jacobson was going to report it, but his radio was out. But he did note that the crew seemed to be hanging around the quarterdeck of the ship, a place where they are usually not allowed. The next afternoon, the crew of another vessel spotted the Deering, sailing a course that would take them directly to the Diamond Shoals, which are an infamous cluster of underwater sandbars hidden beneath the winds that are thought to be responsible for up to 600 shipwrecks. However, the crew reported seeing no one on the Deering's deck. Three days later, the boat was sighted at morning by the Coast Guard station at Cape Hatteras. The vessel had ran aground with all sails set on the outer edge of the Diamond Shoals. At first, rescue ships could not get to the vessel due to bad weather but finally reached it on February 4th, just a few days later, and they found the schooner was completely abandoned. The steering equipment was damaged, the wheel shattered, and the rudder disengaged from its stock. The log and navigation equipment were gone, along with the crew's personal effects and the ship's two lifeboats. Some food was being prepared for the next day's meal at the time of the abandonment. To this day, theories abound. One of those is a hurricane, although that doesn't explain why the men exited the ship in such an orderly manner instead of a panicked one. Another theory was that of pirates, but no concrete evidence of this ever came up. Some suggested that rum runners stole the ship to smuggle liquor, but that was also very doubtful. Some point to the aforementioned first mate who threatened to kill the captain. It suggested that he led a mutiny. It would also explain why the man held the Cape Lookout ship was not Captain Wormwell, nor an officer, and why the men were just wandering about. Another crazy theory was the crew was rescued by the SS Hewitt, which then sunk and lost all hands on deck. Finally, are the paranormal theories, such as sailing through the Bermuda Triangle. Okay guys, I wanted to stop right here for a second. In this series of mysteries, I came across a few that were pretty short. There's not a lot of info on them, and they didn't really fit in with the rest of the mysteries, so I thought I would roll it up into one small quick segment before we enter the home stretch. So let's start with... Antimatter Comets Antimatter Comets are these hypothetical comets that are said to be composed solely of antimatter instead of normal matter. They have never actually been observed, nor are they likely to exist in the Milky Way. However, it's thought they do exist, and if so, it would actually explain a lot of the weird natural phenomena observed over the years, such as the Tunguska event of 1908 or that of ball lightning. The concept was first discussed in the 1940s, 
However, the mystery is, does it really exist? Bruhoth Chaosaurus. Bruhoth Chaosaurus is the informal name given to a dinosaur that was once claimed to be one of the largest land dwelling animals to have ever existed. It was first discovered in 1978 near the southern tip of India. However, this dinosaur is very controversial and many doubt its existence. For one, there was only a few bones that were ever found and those were destroyed in a monsoon, leaving paleontologists with nothing to study except for abstract drawings, although pictures of the bones were rediscovered in 2022. But if it did exist, it suggested that it might reach lengths of 110 to 140 feet, weighing between 120 to 190 tons, making it rival that of the blue whale as one of the largest animals to ever live. Beardens ass. This is a paradox in philosophy that deals with free will. It takes a hypothetical situation where a donkey that is equally hungry and thirsty and is placed midway between a stack of hay and a pail of water. Since the paradox assumes that the donkey will always go to whichever is closer, it dies of both hunger and thirst since it cannot make any rational decision between the hay and water. It's named after the French philosopher Jean Buridan. It's basically a thought experiment where someone who has two equally attractive options is unable to make a decision and loses out. Suggesting that decision making may involve more than rational calculation and could be influenced by other factors. Basically, it's about decision making and free will. Chamberlain Moton Planetesimal Hypothesis The Chamberlain Moton Planetesimal Hypothesis is a historical scientific theory proposed by geologist Thomas C. Chamberlain and Forrest G. Moton in the early 20th century. This hypothesis attempted to explain the formation of planets within our solar system. According to their hypothesis, a star passing close enough to the sun early in its life caused tidal bulges to form on its surface, which eventually was ejected out into orbit. It would eventually cool down and form these planetesimals, which were then thought to have collided into each other and combined to be the building blocks of planets. However, this theory is largely dismissed by the scientific community now. I'm not sure what the mystery in this one is. I think it may have to do with the bigger mystery of the universe, and more specifically, that of our own solar system. Cyber Anakin. This is the pseudonym of a computer hacktivist, known mainly for his retaliation against the Russian government for the shooting down of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. Cyber Anakin, who was then a teenager, targeted Russian websites and databases, including a new site and email provider, exposing the birthdays, passwords, and geographical locations of 1.5 million Russians. It was one of the largest data breaches in Russian history. After dabbing on Russia, he also trolled North Korea. The mystery is just who this person is. Now let's return back to our regular scheduled programming. Confederate Gold. This is a mystery I kept running across when I was building my Southern Mystery Iceberg, and it simply refers to millions of dollars worth of gold that was lost or unaccounted for after the American Civil War. The possible location has been the source of speculation of many historians and treasure hunters alike. The story starts as Union troops are on the verge of invading New Orleans. The Confederates will quickly remove millions of dollars worth of gold to a safer location, that of Columbus, Georgia. It was temporarily stored at a place called the Iron Bank, ran by William H. Young. And on October 11th, 1862, a Confederate general ordered the gold to be taken back from the bank. But the bank's president, Mr. Young, refused to release it until he was forced to do so. And what happened with the gold after this? is a mystery. We do know that as the Confederacy began to collapse, the Chief of Staff of the Union armies wrote that the Confederate President Jefferson Davis was fleeing with large quantities of the treasure and was said to be traveling south from Goldsboro, North Carolina in wagons. The Union generals were instructed to try and intercept Davis and take any wealth that he was transporting. Davis did, in fact, take what was left of the stable value of the Confederate treasury which was about $500,000 worth of gold and silver because Confederate paper currency was worthless at this point. He actually fled from Richmond, Virginia by train, however, but the treasure was becoming too much of an encumbrance on his escape, so he started dispersing it along the way, giving it to some generals to pay troops with and some to several banks. And by the time he was captured in Georgia, he had no money on him. So what happened to the rest of the gold? The main theory seems to revolve around the idea that Davis and the group hid it more specifically, buried it somewhere in Georgia. Others say some of it was hidden in North Carolina because they couldn't get the heavy treasure through the swamps north of Greensboro. Some say 
that the Cumberland Mountains of Central Tennessee has a hidden cache. There's even a crazy story about a treasure finding company claiming to have found Civil War era gold on federal land in Pennsylvania. The FBI came in and dug, but prevented anybody from watching. Citizens then reported that they seen a convoy of SUVs leaving the dig site in the middle of the night. Right after this, the FBI announced they found nothing. The treasure company is in the process of suing the FBI for those records. However, some speculate that it's not buried at all and point the finger at the Michigan Brigade, aka the Michigan Cavalry, who are alleged to have stolen it. Copper Cauldrons of Siberian Valley Siberia is one of the least explored areas in the world, with over 60,000 square miles of western Yakuta completely uninhabited and devoid of any sort of trails. Humans rarely go there. It's nothing but thick forest with uprooted trees and swarms of mosquitoes, not to mention the frigid temperatures, which is why the next mystery is very odd. Although the land is sparsely inhabited, it has been occasionally traversed since the 1800s by the nomadic peoples of the Avinki and Yakuts, as well as lone hunters who have wandered into the area. It's these people that have reported coming across these odd houses, shaped like red hemispheres, protruding from the perpetually frozen ground. The formations were smooth, with an opening at the top and winding stairwell, leading to a circular gallery with numerous metal rooms. And despite the temperatures reaching 40 below, the structures were pleasantly warm. The natives called these mysterious houses cauldrons. They are said to have been forged out of an unknown metal, copper-like in color, but incredibly hard with razor-sharp edges. They were so hard that no one could cut a fragment off of it. Over time, the natives began to notice the cauldrons were slowly sinking into the ground and disappearing, leaving behind large circular strains of dissimilar vegetation. In 1936, one geologist found a cauldron that was not completely submerged yet. It had a smooth metal hemisphere with razor-sharp edges and was reddish in color as it stuck out of the ground. The top stood leaning over so that it was possible to ride under it on a reindeer. The geologist sent the information back to the capital, but no one cared apparently. Even stranger, most of the cauldrons have been located in very distant regions, accessible only by helicopter, but for whatever reason, it's never been deemed interesting enough to warrant an expedition. Even in 1971, a native hunter found one which allegedly contained a skinny black, one-eyed being in an iron costume. No one believed him, despite his willingness to take them out to the location. That hunter would then end up dying before anyone showed enough interest to go look for it. That expedition was eventually launched in 1979, but they could not find any cauldrons, citing the thick vegetation, leaving only rumors of their existence. As of today, there are still no photos of these alleged cauldrons, nor is there any specific information about the location of them, only a vague idea that they're somewhere near one of the Siberian rivers, and the mystery seems to be, are these real? And if so, who made them? Disrupted Planet A disrupted planet typically refers to a hypothetical or theoretical scenario in which a planet has been broken apart, fragmented, or destroyed, often due to external forces or catastrophic events. It's not commonly observed in the universe, and the term is often used in scientific discussions, simulations, or in the context of exploring extreme planetary scenarios. For example, a planet that comes too close to a much larger object, such as a star or a massive gas giant, could experience tidal forces that stretch and eventually break it apart. That process is known as tidal disruption. There's also the theory of a high-velocity collision with other celestial bodies, such as an asteroid, comet, or even other planets, which would cause significant damage and could cause the planet to fragment. Sometimes, internal forces are cited, such as geological activity, volcanic eruptions, or extreme pressures that could lead to the planet breaking up. It's also possible that planets in unstable orbits, or planets that are subjected to intense radiation because they're too nearby to stars or other cosmic events, could cause a planet's disintegration. Finally, the big one is a nearby supernova explosion, which could release a wave of energy and radiation that could disrupt a planet's atmosphere and surface, leading to its destruction. While these are possible, it's extremely rare. I'm not sure what the mystery is in this one. I think it's part of the broader mystery of planets in the universe. Dorothy Arnold On December 12, 1910, 25-year-old 
Dorothy Arnold of New York City would tell her mother that she intended to go shopping for a dress to wear to her younger sister's upcoming debutante party. Dorothy's mother would offer to go with her, but Dorothy declined, telling her she would call her if she found a dress. She then left at around 11 a.m. According to her family, she left with about $25 to $30, or about $785 to $940 now. She walked from her home down to a store on the corner of 5th Avenue and 59th Street. Here, she would charge a half a pound box of chocolates to her account around noon. She then walked 22 blocks, or about 1.4 miles, to a bookstore, where she purchased a book. Outside the store, Dorothy ran into a friend named Gladys King. They would speak briefly about her sister's upcoming party, and Dorothy was in good spirits, which was good because Dorothy had been feeling dejected and embarrassed after the ambitious young writer had a couple of short stories rejected by publishers. Gladys would then excuse herself as she was having lunch with her mother. Dorothy told her she was going to walk home through Central Park. By that evening, Dorothy failed to return home for dinner. That stood out immediately as odd because she never missed meals without informing her family. They became worried and started calling Dorothy's friends, but none of them had seen her, although they did not call Gladys. Now this is where the case takes a strange turn. One of these friends, the Arnold family had dialed, Elsie Henry, would call back at midnight to see if Dorothy had been found. Dorothy's mother answered the phone and said yes, she made it home. When Elsie asked to speak to her though, Mary hesitated before saying Dorothy went to bed with a headache, and that would lead to something even weirder. See, the Arnold family were affluent, and they so desperately wanted to avoid any unwanted media attention that could be socially embarrassing, so they did not report Dorothy missing to the police right away. The Arnolds instead tried to keep it quiet and contacted their friend, who was a lawyer. He, in turn, searched her room before spending the following weeks visiting jails, hospitals, and morgues in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, but he did not find any sign of Dorothy. He eventually suggested hiring a Pinkerton detective. The Pinkertons, again, would search hospitals and other areas that Dorothy was known to go to, as well as questioning her friends and college classmates. After finding literature for transatlantic ocean liners in Dorothy's room one day after she disappeared, they theorized that Dorothy might have eloped with a man to Europe. They searched marriage records, but could not find her name. Agents then went overseas to search ocean liners arriving from New York. They eventually said they couldn't find her and encouraged the family to call the police, which they finally did. And the NYPD wanted Francis, her father, to hold a press conference to get as much publicity as possible, and he resisted, but he eventually gave in, and they offered a reward of $1,000, or about $31,000 in today's money. However, not one clue of the girl was ever found. There were sightings, but these never panned out. There were also letters alleged to be written by Dorothy, but these were deemed as hoaxes and Dorothy would never be seen again, which leads us to the theories. Suicide was one of the early ones suggested, and it was alluded to her lack of progress of becoming a writer. Another one was that she had become pregnant and sought an abortion, and died during or after the botched procedure, and then was secretly buried. In fact, an illegal abortion clinic in Pennsylvania was raided by the police, and a doctor there testified to the New York District Attorney that Dorothy had died there and was burned in the furnace. Others speculate that she was murdered in a robbery gone bad in Central Park. While some speculate her parents knew more than they let on and could also be responsible. Double Murder in Shenandoah National Park On May 19, 1996, 24-year-old Julie Williams of St. Cloud, Minnesota and 26-year-old Lolly Winnens of Unity, Maine pitched their tent off a of Shenandoah National Park course trail. They chose a peaceful spot next to a mountain stream. The two had met years before at Woods Woman, a now defunct organization focused on education and adventure travel for women, and the two decided to embark on a backpacking trip in the park with their golden retriever. The trip was supposed to be a celebration for a new job that Lolly was set to start on June 1st of that year. However, by May 31st, neither girl had arrived back from the trip, and it would be Julie's father Thomas Williams who would report his daughter missing. Rangers started a search and pretty quickly found the girl's car just north of a lodge. They started making quick searches over the trails in the general area, but were unable to locate them. However, they did find the golden retriever wandering through the park unleashed. The next evening, on June 1st, the rangers would eventually find the young women's campsite, and they also found 
the girls' bodies. The two women had been bound and gagged and had their throats slashed. Detectives would note that it was most likely due to the fact they had camped next to the stream, which drowned out the sound of approaching footsteps. Police started retracing their steps and found that they had been seen on the 24th, five days after their journey started and one week before the bodies were found. They also looked through photos left behind in their cameras to see if it would lead to anything. It seems that the two women at one point emerged from the trip due to rain, but then hitched a ride with a park ranger and renewed their camping permit before setting out again. They then climbed the highest mountain in Shenandoah before meeting their violent end. The investigation was handled by the National Park Service Investigative Services along with the FBI and the Virginia State Police, and it would be difficult. First is the obvious. A crime scene outdoors is way more complex than one indoors. Secondly, it's just the number of people going through the park, which allows perpetrators to easily slip in and out unnoticed. There's also the delay that took in finding out a crime had been committed. Law enforcement did catch a break though, when a tourist from Canada, Yvonne Malbasha, was pedaling her bike through the park and a man in a truck forced her off the road and tried to force her into his truck. She fought him off and was able to get away, but was later apprehended by rangers who found hand and leg restraints in his truck. Investigators looked into this man, Daryl David Rice, and they found a lot of suspicious things. In addition to people speaking of his hostile personality, he was also seen on video entering the park on May 25th and again on May 26th. He would be indicted on circumstantial evidence, and he continued to incriminate himself. Prosecutors alleged he had said that women were more vulnerable and he enjoyed assaulting them, and that these two in particular deserved it because they were a lesbian couple. He was charged with capital murder and a hate crime. However, while trying to strengthen their case, a hair found from the crime scene was tested, and it was found not to belong to Rice, and the charges were dropped, and the case remains unsolved. Dumbler Family Between the night and morning of October 22nd and 23rd, 1969, the Dumbler family of Cincinnati, Ohio, Martin, his wife Patricia, and Patricia's mother, Mary Wilson, would see their home invaded by an intruder. This person, who has never been identified, went into the upstairs bedroom of the couple's home and proceeded to tie them up with cords from lights, televisions, and appliances. The suspect then shot all three in the head by what was believed to be a 38 caliber. He then removed the restraints from their arms and ankles and left the crime scene. About an hour later, he returned to the bedroom where he stabbed both Martin and Patricia in the chest. While all this was going on, the couple's young children were asleep downstairs, and luckily, neither child woke up, nor did they end up being harmed. The killer had used pillows to silence the gunshots. The next morning, the five and four-year-old children ran to a neighbor next door, saying they couldn't wake mommy and daddy. The police were called, and when investigators arrived to the scene, they discovered it had been wiped clean without anything left behind. They began to think whoever done this probably had done it before, and maybe has done it since. There was no forced entry, and there was no indication of a robbery. And since the killer did not harm the children, it's believed he knew the family. The detectives would, however, interview around 100 people, check hundreds of tips, and give polygraphs to 20 people, leading to nothing. They then reached out across the country to other police departments, but found no similar murders. Then, a man named J.T. Townsend would write a book about the events, and was even allowed by Cincinnati detectives to review the case files and crime scene photos. After reviewing the evidence, he believes that Martin Dumbler was the target. In fact, Martin was set to inherit his father's lucrative newspaper business, and the day before the murders, he was having a somewhat agitated conversation with a man in the driveway, which happened while his parents were out of town. This led him to a theory, which was the suspect was a relative involved with the newspaper. But of course, that's just an author's thought, not an investigator, and the police have never shared their theory. Dunedin Bauman, 1962, Dunedin, South Island, New Zealand. A lawyer named James Patrick Ward was spending the evening with some work colleagues when one of them would ask how he felt about an appeal that was coming up the next day. Ward replied that they would absolutely win unless something crazy happened, like a bomb being delivered to him the next morning. Little could he know how accurate that prediction would be because the next morning, the 63-year-old went into his office around 9 a.m. When an explosion ripped through the room, his colleagues, one being his nephew, would rush down the hall to the room to see Ward lying on the ground amongst the debris. 
He was severely injured, missing his left hand, and had serious injuries to his chest. He would ask, who could have done this to me? Ward would later die at the hospital. The community was stunned. A bombing? That's unusual. But so was the victim. Ward, although he was difficult to negotiate with, was a good husband and father, and was a devout Catholic, heavily involved with the church. The high-profile case would be assigned to New Zealand's top investigators. The first thing they would do was try to come up with a timeline. They discovered that an employee collected the package from the post office shortly before 8.30 that morning. It was then handed to Ward, along with the letter from his son, when he arrived at the office. The bomb itself was triggered by an electric detonator and was contained in a wooden box, and that's about as far as they got. They did consider suicide at first, but then they realized that was a pretty dumb way to go. They could not find any animosity between Ward and his colleagues, and detectives eventually determined nobody had a motive to kill him, and then the case lost momentum, until detectives finally found their man, James Ward's brother-in-law, who was a man by the name of John Woods. Woods had been taught about explosives in World War II, and he knew how to build a bomb. To add to this, a colleague of John Woods would actually take John's wife to the side and recommend her to get John some psychiatric help. His wife did convince John to go see a doctor, who also said that John needed treatment, but John would not go, and his wife did not push the issue out of fear of offending his family. And here's where crap hits the fan. The couple would actually separate and get a divorce. His wife wanted to work things out, but John declined. It was then that his ex-wife, who I can only find by the name of Mrs. Woods, started to grow close to her sister-in-law, Helen Ward, and her husband and her victim, James Ward. Now, John, even though he didn't want to be married to his ex anymore, absolutely did not want her being a friend of the Wards, and detectives would later describe him as having an obsession with her friendship with them. The reasoning for this is he claimed by James and Helen being friendly with his ex-wife, it caused a rift in the family, which was taking a toll on the health of his parents. And I don't know the family dynamics here, because there's not a lot of info, but apparently he threatened both James Ward and his son on multiple occasions. He became the chief suspect, but was never charged. This one technically should not be on here, since according to the detectives involved, everyone knew it was Woods. They just couldn't find that one piece of evidence they needed. Dwayne McCorkendale, November 12th, 1988, Chandler, Oklahoma. 911 operators would take a report from an anonymous caller who said they had seen the body of a man lying beside a phone booth at a rest stop at mile marker 31. The Oklahoma Highway Patrol were dispatched and reached the scene about 8 p.m. They did find the man and he had been murdered and coins had been scattered about his body. This man would later be identified as a 27-year-old truck driver from Kansas City, Kansas, Dwayne McCorkendale. Police found his truck parked at the stop. He had been killed by a 12-gauge shotgun blast to the back of the head at close range in what seemed to be a robbery. Investigators would start retracing Dwayne's movements that day. They were unsure if this killer was just waiting at the truck stop for a victim or if maybe this killer had a CB radio because one of the early theories was that whoever this was had been listening to that radio waiting for a victim because it was known that Dwayne did tell other truckers about 3.45 p.m that he planned to pull over at the rest stop to call his wife. It was then he was standing at the phone when he was shot and killed from behind and then robbed of $25. Outside of this, clues were scarce. That is, until the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation started putting notices in trucker magazines across the U.S. Almost immediately, they started to get calls. Apparently, numerous truckers called in about a brown Ford Pinto equipped with a CB radio. The Pinto was driving erratically and trying to cut off 18-wheelers, which seems dumb to me, with 10 reports from five different states. Apparently, one of these truckers called the driver to say that was no way to drive here. Someone could get hurt. The Pinto driver replied, So, we've already killed one trucker, and we'll kill another if you get in our way. In other instances, the Pinto driver would call truckers and speak in a threatening manner. He told one trucker to leave us alone or we'll do to you what we did to this other trucker. Now, was this someone just trying to connect themselves to a crime to feel big, or were they the ones really behind it? That's unsure. However, three weeks later, another trucker would call police and tell of a scary situation. He had stopped to eat lunch when a young woman approached him. She was described as being kind of trashy and acting strangely. 
like she was on drugs, she would ask the driver for some dope and said that she and her friend had been visiting friends in Texas and were trying to get back to Alabama if he could help them find a road to get there. When he turned to reach for the map, she stuck half of her body inside the truck and started asking for spare money because she needed a fix real bad. He told her he would not give her the money for that. While this was going on, a brown Ford Pinto pulled up. She jumped down from the truck and got in the car and they took off. That encounter took place one day before Dwayne's murder and just 13 miles south on the same highway. To this day, it's the strongest lead in the case. The suspects were described as a white male, a black male, and sometimes a white female. However, this is another one that might actually be solved, and it ties to a former mystery, that of the El Dorado Jane Doe who was found murdered in 1991 by her ex-boyfriend slash pimp James McAlphin. This Jane Doe had claimed to some that she used to lure truck drivers to somewhere so that her boyfriend James could rob them and told people that her and James had killed one truck driver already. That woman was unidentified until 2022 when her first name was established as Kelly, although her surname has not been released due to privacy concerns. But in this picture, you can see Kelly as well as James, and according to online conjecture, that's a brown Ford Pinto to the left. I've tried to digitally enhance it, and maybe a car buff out there will be able to confirm if that is indeed a Ford Pinto. If so, the last question is, where is the white male suspect that was traveling with them? Edgecombe County Serial Killer And we finish with the serial killer who operated in Edgecombe and Halifax counties of North Carolina. The victims were all African American and were engaged in prostitution and had drug issues. There are 10 suspected victims and two were never found. And just a heads up on this one, there's very little info, so if it sounds like I'm skimming over it, it's not out of disrespect, it's just not a lot out there. The serial killer is allegedly unidentified, but I'll explain why that is in a second. On June 2nd, 2005, a 29-year-old woman, Melody Wiggins, of Rocky Mount, North Carolina, was found deceased and partially stripped in Edgecombe County. Melody had only been reported missing just three days before. The autopsy would also reveal that she had received several knife wounds and blows from a blunt object to the head. However, this would not be the only one, as there would be at least nine more victims found over the next few years. That of Jackie Thorpe, who was found on May 8, 2007. Her head and arm had been cut off. Then, 50-year-old Ernestine Battle, who was found on March 14, 2008. Then, on March 7, the following year, Taraha Shanice Nicholson was found deceased near the Seven Bridges Road, which a lot of these were found, and has given the killer the other moniker, the Seven Bridges Killer. In this murder, an autopsy could at least determine her cause of death, unlike a lot of these previous ones, and that cause was strangulation. The next would be 43-year-old Christine Boone, who was found on March 9, 2010. Then a year later, in January 2011, 36-year-old Yolanda Lancaster's remains were found by hunters nearly two years after being reported missing. A week after this, 33-year-old Elizabeth Smallwood was found on a soccer field in Rocky Mount. Then, on June 29th, another victim was found near the Seven Bridges Road, that of 31-year-old Jarnice Hargrove, who had been reported missing in April. Her teeth had been beaten out of her skull. Then, a victim found by a man riding an ATV on March 27, 2010, was identified as 40-year-old Roberta Williams, and she too was found by Seven Bridges Road. Finally, 46-year-old Joyce Durham was last seen in 2007 and is suspected of being deceased. Now, as I said, the mystery here is supposed to be the identity of the serial killer. However, traces of sperm was found on Nicholson's body, and it would be in 2009 when a man named Antoine Pittman, a convicted felon with a lengthy rap sheet, was arrested for DUI that his DNA was taken and matched with that found on Nicholson. Investigators looked closer and realized he had been living in the area the past six years, meaning he could be responsible for all these murders. He even visited Seven Bridges Road area often as a teen, and he had lived in his grandparents' home, which was just a few miles away from where five of the victims were found. And in the six years he had lived there, he lived close to Seven Bridges Road. He also briefly lived in a house near the soccer field where another victim was found. 
And finally, he had rented a trailer in another part of town where one of the bodies was found. So, there was overwhelming circumstantial evidence, but he was found guilty and sentenced to life because of the DNA found on Nicholson. He was never tried for the others, but detectives have basically said, hey, it's him. The murders even stopped once he was arrested. However, I would be amiss if I did not mention the other side. Defenders of Pittman claim that the prosecutor did not charge him for the other murders because there is no evidence linking him. And furthermore, the DNA left on Nicholson was from consensual sex after he paid her. Finally, it's the claim that the county just wanted the case to go away and that the police didn't seriously investigate their murders because they were prostitutes. That brings us to the conclusion of this installment of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. I hope you all enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.